Good evening and welcome. My name is Dr. Christina Greer and I'm an Associate Professor of Political Science at Fordham University. The video you just saw includes one of this evening's panelists, Dr. Michael A. Lindsay. It illustrates just some of the pressures that affect not only Black adults, but our youth. In a moment, you'll learn more about why we're ringing the alarm with this evening's program. We're here as Black children and teens face unprecedented challenges to their mental well being. They face a world transformed by COVID 19 and racked by a reckoning of racial justice. This evening's experts will discuss long-term and recent mental health trends, as well as the actions we must take to help Black youth thrive. Then they'll answer your questions. So please enter your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll choose several for the panelists to answer. Also, if you're posting about this on social media, please use the hashtag, hashtag ring alarm for our youth. And that's the number four. So that's hashtag ring alarm for our youth. Our co-sponsors for this event include the NYU Nick Silver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research, of which I'm a former fellow, the Greater New York Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, the East Harlem Tutorial Program, the Boys and Girls Club of Harlem, and the New York Chapter of 100 Black Men. Now I'll introduce this evening's panelists. Dr. Rihanna Elise Anderson is an assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, focusing on culturally specific parenting practices to reduce race-related stress in families. Dr. Donna Holland Barnes is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Howard University. She focuses on suicidal behaviors and belongs to the school's Suicide Prevention Action Group. Jeff Ginsberg is the executive director of the East Harlem Tutorial Program, EH. TP, which focuses on increasing the college graduation, graduation rate in East Harlem. Dr. Donna Jones is superintendent of the Patchogue Medford School District in New York and president of the Greater New York Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. Dr. Michael A. Lindsay is executive director of the NYU McSilver Institute and a noted scholar in the field of child and adolescent mental health, particularly in the study of suicide and depression. I think my memory serves me correctly. He's also a Morehouse man and an alpha. So on MLK Day, I think that should be noted. And last but definitely not least is Ann williams Ison, And she is the Dumpson Chair in Child Welfare in the Graduate School of Social Services of Fordham University and the former CEO of the Harlem Children's Zone Education Nonprofit. Thank you all so much for joining me. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So just this is, I'm gonna throw this out to everyone. Uh, and I think Michael, how about you get us started? So please tell us what you do and what trends you're seeing that concern you relating to the mental health of our, of our black children and teens. Hi, good evening everyone. And thank you all for joining us on this uh, discussion of a really, really important issue in our community that quite frankly, we're not talking enough about. Um, as you mentioned, I am the executive director of the NYU McSilver Institute at, um, at New York University. And um, what, what, what we've been seeing over the last um, at least 25, close to 30 years is an upward trend in terms of suicide behaviors among black uh, adolescents in particular, but also among younger age kids between the ages of five and 11 years old, that suicide rates have actually increased among Black youth at an alarming rate. And so it's concerning, and we'll talk more about some of the reasons why, but those are the things that we're seeing that gives us uh, great concern. Dr. Anderson, would you like to pick up from where Dr. Lindsay left off? Sure, and I would also like to echo my gratitude. It's a pleasure to be here today on this MLK Day. So it's really important to think about what Dr. Lindsay was saying with respect to suicidality, that's getting a lot of attention right now. And also what got quite a bit of attention this summer was the talk, the conversation that Black families were having with their children about this visualization of the dehumanization of Black people, right? So we're watching eight minutes and 46 seconds of a man's life being snuffed out in front of us. How do you talk to your kids about that? So my work deals with the talk, how Black families are engaging in that conversation and goes beyond just all right, we've noted that information, but what do we actually do about it? So I'm training clinicians on how to have that talk effectively with families and for families to be able to engage with this really challenging content with each other and also manage the racial stress and trauma 
that comes along with it. So really trying to prevent some of those outcomes that Dr. Lindsay was just talking about. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, what do you see when, when you're working with parents and students uh, in East Harlem? Uh, yeah, sure. So first of all, thank you so much to NYU for, for having me. Thank you, Dr. Greer, for uh, hosting this conversation. Um, you know, so I run East Harlem tutorial program, after school program since the 1950s. I've also founded our schools and been in the neighborhood for 15 years. Our schools are called Scholars Academy. So across our schools and after school programs, uh, what I hope I can contribute to this conversation is just what I'm hearing from our staff, from our teachers, from our social workers, from everyone, um, in their concerns about just not being with our students uh, on a day to day basis, not being with our families, those touch points that ensure that um, we are creating the human relationships that enable real conversations to have um, to happen um, so we can understand our students' stories, so we can help them write their own new story. Uh, and so, you know, to see uh, this incredible report, this critical report from McSilver and their urgency to keep saying, ring the alarm and they're willing, you know, not willing to back down from that. Um, that's what we're also feeling and seeing on the ground. That's what I hear from our staff and our teachers. And those concerns were before this moment and are particularly heightened in an extraordinary way by this moment. Right, and Dr. Barnes, uh, is that something you're seeing uh, in your research and your work? Oh, let's unmute you. We don't wanna miss the brilliance. Okay, there I am. There we Thank go. You. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm seeing the same thing. I'm, I, I'm getting really concerned about since COVID, how these young kids are feeling lost, uncertain, confused. And there is a need to create more spaces, um, like Dr. Ginsburg talked about, being able to communicate with these kids because they feel ashamed that they're vulnerable. They feel that they have to meet these male codes and being ashamed that you're vulnerable makes them internalize and then they don't talk about it. So if they have like a circle, I call them empathy circles of every kids who are having issues to talk about their issues, be open about it. So other kids can say, well, that's happening to me too. I feel the same way. And then they don't feel so alone because the, the big issue is that they feel alone. Hmm. Thank you. And Dr. Jones? Sure. Um, working as a superintendent of schools in a suburban school district, I have to echo all of the uh, things that were said this evening. Um, it's such a challenge for the children. They are sincerely confused. There's an increased level of absenteeism and disengagement among the children. There, there's an increased sentiment of despair due to the isolation and the confusion. There's so much uncertainty. Their grades are affected by this all and they're having such difficulty adapting to change. So there is a need to have this conversation in order for us to, um, to just assist them in navigating these most challenging times. It's, um, it's very difficult to see the children that went from thriving, vibrant children uh, to those that seem to be somewhat confused and disengaged. And sometimes you'll jump into a classroom and you'll see them whether they're on a virtual platform or in person, and they just seem to be in a fog. And it's very difficult to see that. And I've seen uh, trends of heightened anxiety, uh, stress levels because of food insecurities, stress levels because of fear of COVID, loss of family members, and all of the like. So every day is a challenge for us. And them dealing with the um, trying to adapt on a daily basis to being in school, being on full remote, um, and not knowing from day to day whether their activities are going to go back to some semblance of normalcy is truly a challenge for them. So 
I, I am so honored and appreciative to be on this panel because this is a discussion that needs to be had. Thank you so much. And Ann Williams uh, um, Isom, uh, last but not I least. I name. know, I know. I just need, you just need to have me over when this is all over so we can okay. just sit down and have some family time. But um, can you just help contextualize uh, what your colleagues have just said? Well, you know, I the way I was thinking about it and so happy to be here with all of you was as a mother, as a resident of Harlem, this, is, this issue of trauma is not something that just happened with the pandemic or just happened because of George Floyd. I'm not sure about the communities that all of the people who are watching this come from, but in my community, which was the 97 blocks in Harlem where we serve 13,000 young people, about 30% of the kids that went to our school had a family member that was murdered. We, there's something called adverse childhood experiences and we did a um, survey of some of our kids in our Promise Academy one. And over 25% of our kids had an ACE score of four or above. And Dr. Lindsay is shaking his head because two years ago in 2018, I went to him and I said, who can help me deal with the trauma that these young black and brown children are dealing with a variety of issues. So Dr. Greer, this issue becomes important because they kind of needed to be prepared before this moment. They're gonna need to be prepared after this moment. And so there's many tools that I think that this um, group can share with us about what does that mean and how can we make sure that young people have what they need. There's a, a school, PS197, which is around the corner of us where 38% of the children are in live in a shelter. So we know the vulnerability that our young people, regardless of what school they go to, where they're coming from. And so now this is on top of what, what they experience. So I'm happy that we're having this discussion. It's a very important discussion, but it's something that needs to continue and we really need to talk about solutions. Well, I, I think for my panelists, the way Ann williams Ison has framed this uh, is in this duality of, of COVID and also racial injustice. And so for Dr. Lindsay, Dr. Barnes and Dr. Anderson, can you walk us through and talk to us about what the research is telling us about the effects of what we would argue are sort of twin pandemics, COVID-19 and our nation's reckoning with racial injustice on the mental health of black children and black teens. And so Dr. Lindsay, uh, I'll start with you. Uh, how are we going to deal with these twin pandemics of COVID-19 and racial reckoning? Um, so one thing to, to, to further contextualize is just, as you mentioned, the research. Um, there was a study out of Harvard uh, in 2018 that suggested if you lived uh, in a community where there was a police shooting of a Black person, that it had an impact on you if you were Black. Not if you were white, but if you were Black, right? Um, there's another study or a stat that suggests that um, during the pandemic, June of 2020, 25% of young people ages 18 to 24 said that in the last 30 days, they were contemplating suicide. And so this is a visceral reaction, obviously, to traumatic events. What we have been calling for for some time now in our work at McSilver and demonstrating to, through some of the work that we do in terms of our step up program is putting uh, emotional and behavioral uh, health supports in schools uh, where kids have proximity to them. Um, we need more social workers in school, more mental health providers proportionate to the numbers of kids in schools. And so uh, I know through my work with Anne and through our work with Jeff that they're on the, on the front lines, if you will, in terms of the providers, uh, the educational providers who are doing that work. Uh, you know, Dr. Jones, what you're seeing in terms of your work as a superintendent and you're calling out the fact that kids are anxious and, and, and dealing with the, the, the uh, you know, consequences of, of all of these traumas is, is, is really important because you know, I'm not sure that we're always talking about those issues in that way. And so to the extent then that we can get providers into schools, if we can have more educators like the ones on our panel tonight talking about these issues and doing something about it in the way that all of our educators here have done, Superintendent Jones and, um, and Jeff, I know you've done this work. And so we just need more folks 
in the educational space have an appreciation for the importance of addressing the behavioral health needs of kids. Thank you. And Dr. Barnes, how do you think we should address this, this twin pandemic of COVID-19 and racial reckoning with our I black agree with everything that I agree with everything that Dr. Lindsay had said. We need to do more of, of bringing counselors into the schools. We also need to build on, on emotional skills. These kids need to learn emotional skills. The, it's, one of the problems, I have so much to say, I'm sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. One of the problems is that, you know, when they experienced violence before the COVID, when someone mentioned before COVID, they had, they had already experienced violence. When they experienced that, and they said 70% had experienced a, a homicide, they would be expected to go back to school and continue as usual. No, we did a study in Washington, D.C. and found out 70% of the kids that we looked at, over 500, had experienced homicide. If, if it wasn't a neighbor, it was a parent or, or a brother or a sister. And when we asked if they were approached about how to handle that, they said, no, nobody ever asked them about that. Mm -hmm. Grief is something that these kids also need to um, be a part of grief recovery because they're grieving. They're grieving the loss of a lot of things that they don't get a chance to talk about. So building emotional strength, having these empathy circles that I was talking about needs to be, be materialized so that these kids can talk about a lot of things, not just COVID, not just uh, police brutality, but all the things that they've been going on, going through right. for a very long time. So I agree with everything Dr. Lindsay said. Dr. Anderson, I saw you shaking your head while Dr. Barnes was speaking. Uh, it, it seems as though you, you know this well about uh, helping students navigate not just COVID-19, but all the other factors that Dr. Barnes just mentioned. Yeah, and I think it's really important for us to contextualize this first. So I'm, I'm not sure how um, everyone is coming to this call and, and what information folks have, but we're talking about two pandemics. One of the pandemics is COVID. The other is this idea of racism and what happens with police brutality in particular. But when you think about what racism has done over time to Black children, to Black communities, we're not talking about it just sporadically happening. We're not talking about a few years back. We're talking about the system that's created the, the lives, the very lives that children live before they're born. Right, so before birth, what's happening with them in utero is literally by design. The chemicals that are in their waters, the toxins that are in the air, where that mother goes back to when they go to live, where that child gets food from, where they go to school, like this is literally a systemic problem. So racism, is, what I've tried to address this summer is that racism is not something that is an, a singular incident, nor is it specific to one system. It is the way in which silos are created to impact Black children and their families this way. So it is the, the tie that binds all of these systems together that would make it such that even if everyone on this call did exactly what the two speakers just said, and we got our efforts into the schools and we got our efforts into uh, hospitals or wherever we need to be, that there's still gonna be nine other spaces that our Black children are being jacked up in. So I, I just wanna really underscore that I, I am, incredibly infuriated that we would even stop at, at this agreement that yeah, it's a dual pandemic right now because it's been a dual pandemic or it's been a, a, a pandemic of incredible proportions for black children for so long that we can't operate in a silo of behavioral health or, or schools. We have to really think about how do we go across these systems to really drop kick racism the way that we need to. So that, that's my thought on that. Well, it's interesting, Dr. Anderson, I was speaking to someone this summer about this, and to your point, uh, we oftentimes look at racism as the shark, and someone said, to help you to really understand it, it's the water. It's the water. It's, it's the water. It's not actually the shark. Everything we're swimming in, everything we're ingesting, so it, it impacts all of our being and the, the space around us, so I think that's a beautiful example. Thank you all so much. So now I want to um, skip over to Dr. Jones. Uh, Ann Isom, Ann Williams Isom. <laughs> I am coming over to your home and I'm going to spend time with you, your family, and your husband. <laughs> um, Ann Williams Isom and Jeff Ginsburg. So my question for you three, and Dr. Jones, I'll start with you, is to our K through 12 educators on the panel. So how can schools better address Black children's mental health needs, especially in the time of COVID-19? So 
uh, Dr. Jones, I'll start with you. Sure, sure. And, and, and Dr. Greer, one thing that I would like to echo to, to what was already said by Dr. Anderson, in addition to the dual pandemic that's going on, I, all, I submit to you that there's also a financial pandemic that's affecting our ability to provide the resources and particularly those communities of color that are marginalized, in general, all districts, but those that are marginalized and of color are gonna have less resources because they rely more on state aid that will be less because we know in New York State, we're facing a $15 billion budget gap uh, for the subsequent years. So we know that there's no question that they need more social workers, they need more psychologists, we need more guidance counselors to, to support the challenges that they're facing, but we're also dealing with having less resources and how we're gonna funnel our resources in order to support. So I'd like to start with saying that, and your question to me was how can schools better address black children's mental health needs? I would say it's critically important and hopefully the schools do have counselors, um, psychologists, social workers that can provide those supports. There needs to be a, a social and emotional curriculum. There is one provided by the state education department and really it should be incumbent upon superintendents and principals and other administrators to ensure that that curriculum is embedded in everything that they do in the classroom. There needs to be a sentiment that teachers truly care. One of the challenges that we face in a lot of school districts is that the children, the teachers don't look like the children that they're serving in many communities. Sometimes it's communities of color and, and um, on the island or in the city, depending on uh, what borough you're in. And so the children, sometimes there's a cultural competence issue where the teachers don't really understand the children. They don't understand the culture of the children and therefore they don't understand what's going on within them. So it's critically important to, for teachers to get to build strong relationships with children so they can better understand and detect things that may be going on within them because they truly understand them. They need to lighten up on the assignments when necessary, because if the child does not have a strong mental health, they can't do anything. So it's better for us to help them deal and navigate with the stressful times that they're having and lighten up where necessary and give grace where necessary to be able to make up a homework assignment and work with the families. Last of all, it's critically important when you don't see a child to check up, to reach out with the parents. They could have lost a loved one. They could be um, dealing with um, the increase that we're dealing with of child childhood ab abuse in the household because they're not in school. We're not seeing them. It's harder to detect. Um, and so I think that those are some ways that we can begin to start um, to address some of the challenges in the schools. Thank you. And I, I noticed myself as an educator extending a lot more grace as well. Uh, Ann Williams, Isom, what do you say uh, to, to the, the mental health of, of children during this time of COVID-19? So, and you asked about schools, um, Dr. Greer, but when I think about it, I don't see the walls of the schools as being real. And we have the, um, the luxury of being in a community. So the kids that go to school 10 blocks from here are also my neighbors and see me on the street. And so what I... Oh, I've got, got, I've got Ann frozen. Okay, oh. you're back, Ann, thank you. Oh, sorry. I said, um, how would we des design a system if we really love the kids? And what we have right now in most schools is not, go ahead, I see my sister over there going like that. And so we are trying to build up protective factor, factors around them and give them the armor that they need to go out and swim in this toxic water that Dr. Anderson talked about. 
So we don't stand, I, I loved it. Dr. Jones said some cultural competency. I'm gonna say some people are racist. And so if you act racist and if you don't act in the best interest of children, you can't work at this organization. And so we build, and I also believe that there's prevention that we can do. So we built an emotional wellness initiative two years ago because we're trying to create an, an, uh, an environment where kids feel loved and healthy and confident to talk to people, not just in a moment of crisis, but all the time. So I know that a lot of people may not be able to build that, but I think we need to think about what would it look like if it were our kids? How would we build the system about our kids? I don't know what you guys have been doing, but through all of this, I've been talking to my children. I've been trying to, I call it lay eyes on them and see how they, when are they talking, when are they not talking? My 25 year old son may not want to talk, but you got to find ways to pull it out of them so that you can see what they're going through because we know that they are suffering. So mm -hmm. that. For me, that's how I approach sort of being an educator and looking at a community leader and really sort of embracing all of the children. Right. Thank you. And, and Jeff, what are you seeing in the work that you're doing in East Harlem? Yeah, I think I'm going to answer this just sort of within the lens of we have a set of core values. One of them is humility. And I think I want to do it through, through my lens and then talk about others. So while I appreciate uh, Dr. Lindsay's compliments for our work, and I think we have made progress on several fronts, it's, I think it's really important. I know I've had to step back and, and say, okay, we've spent many years um, saying we're striving toward being an anti-racist organization, but you know, were we honoring sort of, you know, I think we've, we've got to say the, the famous quote from King today that you know, of all the forms of inequality, injustice and health is the most shocking and inhumane, right? That's, that's what King told us. And then we are in education talking about college, 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 graduation. Well, you can't get to those things. You can't do those things unless you recognize um, what King said to be true. And actually, I think, I know I would urge anyone who's, who's on this, particularly white people watching this to, to recognize if you're in this work in education, you can't just talk about college like it's something. You can't just talk about achievement like it's something, right? Um, we have to have systems set up to, as we've talked about tonight, address trauma, right? And you know, we started up schools initially years ago without that thinking. And then, and then catching up is not a place you want to be in, right? Because um, this is lives on, on the line, right? And so, but then when you are catching up, you, of course, run into the systems we're all talking about tonight, which is there aren't any, you know, and I'm struck that uh, to support educators to address this in a systematic way. Well, I'm struck by what, you know, Dr. Barnes said that, you know, we're constantly not ready, you know, trauma happens, and then we ask kids go right back to school. Cool. Well, guess what we're about to do after COVID? Where's the plan, right? Everyone's talking about going back to school, the spring, the fall. When's it going to be? When's it going to be? Well, maybe when is actually not the only question. Like, what is school? Are we taking a chance to really even redefine it? And I know I've had to push myself and our team has had to do that. And I'll just end by saying that we should also have um, the humility to be clear in what expertise we are asking of our teachers. So I think this evening, many of us could talk about what we expect of teachers. Well, when I talk to staff about it, when I talk to our superintendent, our leadership, I think the fair expectation of practice that we try to honor is that teachers should not ask to be accountable beyond their expertise. So teachers have to have the conversations and they need to bring meaning to learning, but then they have to be able to work in team and with support from a mental health professional, right? Someone who also, by the way, knows the child, isn't just brought in at the moment, but really knows the child, knows the family, and they've got to work together to do that unpacking and then make meaning and tell their new story. And so all those things, I think, take humility and leadership, but they do take a plan. And, and I don't think, you know, there really is one out there. And, and, so, and so we've got to be humble enough to address that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lindsay, I want to bring you back in because I, I want to make sure I get to all of you uh, at least one more time before we start pulling in uh, some of the questions that are coming in. But Dr. Lindsay, how do we, uh, how do these unrecognized mental health problems contribute uh, to this overall, this overarching problem that's been laid out so clearly? Uh, and how can social workers help us um, navigate this? Yeah, you know, the thing that I really worry about, particularly what Jeff just mentioned and, and the others, um, you know, in terms of the educational space, I, I, I worry about the, um, and Anne brought this up earlier in terms of the ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences. What we know about those ACEs is that they impact kids 
developmentally, they actually stunt their development um, over time, the extent to which kids are constantly uh, experiencing traumas. And so I do think that we need a really comprehensive game plan. I know in the, uh, in the, in the Biden um, bill, uh, the stimulus bill, it calls for uh, greater attention around uh, child poverty and the uh, you know, sort of things that are gonna help raise kids out of poverty. Some of that includes you know, the kinds of behavioral health supports and services that they need relative to being in consistently traumatizing environments. And so I, I think I just wanted to put that, 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 that point out there that it's really going to take uh, comprehensive planning, really careful thinking from those in the developmental space who understand child development, um, but also you know, those who are obviously in the behavioral health space and then educators. So it needs that sort of comprehensive kind of, uh, of, of teamwork. What I think social workers can do is all of the above in terms of what uh, Superintendent Jones mentioned, um, uh, uh, you know, Anne and, and Jeff around the kind of cultural humility uh, and competence that it's going to take to provide, uh, you know, carefully intentional services that are going to meet the needs of kids and their families. I think we need to be looking not just as, at, at the kid and, and their individual struggles, but also work with families. And so oftentimes it is the case that we are looking exclusively at the child and not putting the family into the framework of our intervention. And so I think that's gonna be really important. And I also think that what social workers can do is help the school staff, um, school personnel understand what those signs and symptoms and indications that kids are struggling with uh, trauma and other kinds of behavioral health challenges. Um, you know, so I, I think all of that becomes really, really critical in terms of what social workers can do um, to, to really best meet the needs of kids. Thank you. And, and Anne and Jeff, I want to circle back with you two, uh, because I want you all to talk to us a little bit more about what practices you're seeing in school to help disrupt some of the things that Michael uh, just laid out. So Anne, I'll start with you. Okay, so in what we did was we started at the top. We didn't make it just a, an initiative that was going to be in some small unit for just a small group of kids. We had it come from the CEO integrated it into our values of the organization, we hired additional staff that was going to be directed towards emotional wellness. And that wasn't just social workers. It was Jeff, sometimes teachers who said, this is something that I'm going to, um, I'm interested in and wanted to be champions for it. We got a great advisory board like um, Dr. Lee and other people who were experts in the community. And we wanted to create a culture of self-care because, um, and I talk about this all the time, if the adults are not well and healed, right? And the adults are those kids who had ACEs before and because nobody wants to do any therapy and that's not for us and mental health is not our thing, then they grow up to be the kids that are with the kids. So we wanted a whole kind of organizational change around um, self-care. Um, things like sleep, nutrition, exercise, those, I know it sounds like it has something else, but that really has an effect on your mental health. And so it was something that we kind of demanded and made time in the schedule for teachers, for young people, for parents even to come in and exercise on our premises because we set out what we wanted to do and we wanted to be healthy. We called it Healthy Harlem. And Healthy Harlem includes your physical health and your mental health so we could really reduce, reduce the stigmas that were associated with it. So that's the way that we really, um, we did it. We put our, our money where our mouth is. I know Dr. Jones talked about resources. I think there, you know, we, there are resources for this work and we should demand it because if not, we see where kids are gonna end up in the pipeline, sick in hospitals. So I look at this as prevention work and a good investment in the communities to keep us well. So that's, that's how we did it at the Harlem Children's Zone. Thank you. And, and Jeff, I mean, I, I love Anne's idea of the synergy of, of, of mental and physical well-being. 
you know, I, I had a bedtime as, as a young person. I put myself on a bedtime uh, for quite some time uh, because I grew up in a family that recognized, you know, something as basic as sleep actually does change how, how you receive information, how you are received in the world. Jeff, what are some of the things that you all are doing in East Harlem to sort of build this foundation uh, for the kids that you work with? And also yeah. tell us where we can get this amazing sweatshirt. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's easy. Just give me your address, but, but the, we'll, we'll, we'll send out the sweatshirt, but I think, um, I, so first of all, the best, the best part of our, our work is we get to cheat. So we, we, we cheat on everything we can from Harlem children's zone and everyone else has had good ideas. And so a number of the things that Ann listed are things that we've also tried to implement. I think what I try to add on here is that if you ask a lot of our particular social work staff, but additional staff as well, they'll tell you that the fact that we provide them a heavy amount of training and trauma-focused therapy programs and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, that we support that work, that that's what we hire for, that that's what we're training for. I think it's also really important. This takes real experience, right? So you, yes, you will have a new staff coming along and they will learn, but, but this is not something that your first year uh, practitioner does well. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm literally preaching to the choir in this within this group of extraordinary panelists. Um, so you know the work that this takes. And that is, by the way, a real challenge And that we obviously, it's hard. We don't have always enough supply when we go out to find or we don't have enough money to pay to get the best people or, or we don't have the, the, the budget to do that from the state local governments. I think partnerships are crucial. Um, we, you know, we are literally trying to build right now coming out of the gate, uh, some work with, you know, Reverend Waller and the Hope Center with NYU, um, with Hunter School Social Work, with various other partners on the ground to try to think about how to do this together as a community-based group. We've been trying to redefine the idea that if you say you're community-based, like we do, and we claim that mantle, and many times we have, and sometimes we've come short. Where we've come short is you, you, you must truly be trauma-based and trauma-oriented to say you're community-based. It just doesn't make sense if you're working in uh, a community of black and brown students. If you can't address that, if you're working with any student, you've got to know what, what makes them tick um, and they've got to know what makes you tick. I would add to what Ann added, you, not only do you need to support adults for their self-care, but you can't ask a child to share their story when you have adults who won't share theirs. And you can't expect that incongruous stories are gonna somehow match up. So obviously the, the vast majority of our teachers identify as people of color, um, and you know, and it's BIPOC, and they. I think it's important that that teachers and the students can build the relationships from there as well. Uh, so I think those are just some of the key practices. I would just uh, add a last piece, which is almost none of these practices are paid for or incentivized financially in any way, shape, or form. The dollars come in, and you better figure out how to spend them. And no one asks you if you're doing this work. Not not a dime. And so. I think that's hugely problematic. And so these are just things that Ann and I are talking about that we chose to do, but no one literally forced us to do it. Uh, and that is a huge problem. Um, so I just wanna note that in here. Thank you. And then I wanna bring in Dr. Barnes and Dr. Anderson really briefly. Um, I want, uh, Dr. Barnes, I'll start with you. How can parents recognize some of these signs of mental health distress uh, in their children and what should they do about it? It's difficult for parents sometimes to know what's typical and what's troubling in reference to their children. So they need to be able to discern that and it's very difficult. So what they, what they can do is listen to what they're talking about. Are they talking about no hope for the future? Are they talking about feeling like they are a burden? Because that's one of the biggest things that kids feel like when they start looking at suicide is that they're a burden. Acting anxious, agitated, are reckless and withdrawing and feeling isolated. Um, so the thing to do when you see a child, if you think that your child is even thinking of suicide, chances are they probably are because you're thinking that they are. If, if you feel that, do not leave them alone. Remove access to means the best way you can, such as guns, drugs, and alcohol. And it really concerns me now because of what's going on in our political climate that Black families are being told to make sure they have guns in their house, blah, 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 blah. And that concerns me because I'm not sure if that's gonna cause the suicide rate to go up because 
suicide can be very impulsive. And when there's a gun available, I mean, there, there's no turning back. Uh, and call a responsible person for help. And it doesn't always have to be a medical person. Suicide prevention is everybody's problem, even if it's one of their friends, because sometimes you cannot handle it alone. The other thing we need to do for our young kids is, is build adult protective shields. They need to have that, such as mentors that help guide our children through life and lead by example put responsible adults in their life. Thank you so much. And Dr. Anderson, what do you say? I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm gonna to try to put a few things that I've heard together. So two lines of thought here, um, the talk, walk, and the chalk. So if you need something to, to memorize, think about the talk, walk, and the chalk. You have to be able to talk to your children. Just Anne is my spirit sister. She said everything that I wanted to say about that conversation. So you can't effectively do it with your child if you're burdened, if you are bagged down with some of the things that you've experienced 20 years ago. So practice with yourself, practice with a loved one, a partner, a clinician, so that you can get your story and get that off of your chest as, as well. The walk is when we apply it. So what is it that we're going to actually say to our children? What are we actually going to do to expose them to some of the things that we want them to learn about? There are plenty of media resources, Sesame Street, Embrace Race, so many things that I can name that are really important and impactful. So walk it out, apply the work that you're doing. And the chalk piece is the procedure and the policy. So how do we have schools? How do we have mental health clinics? How do we have places that are going to put into practice what Jeff was saying so that we're actually able to account for it? We're not just paying lip service. We're actually saying you have to meet this criteria to work with our children to uh, get this funding, et cetera. So how do we get the policy to support that? So that's a talk, walk, and chalk real quick. I would be remiss if I did not talk about the talk with all families. So let me be very clear that Anne also mentioned the shields and the protective gear that we're putting forth to our black children. They need it because they're being impugned by various things coming at them. So we would not need those things if they did not have things being shot or thrown at them. So let's be very clear that when white families this summer were asking, is it too early for us to talk to our children? Is, is race actually an issue for them? Those white children were the ones sitting around and watching lynchings occur. They were going to be mob um, participants. They were standing there throwing things at children who were integrating schools. Children can be bystanders. They can also be active agitators in racism. So don't mistake that your child can be one of those people engaging. So it is not fair for Black families to be the only ones engaging in this work. And again, we wouldn't have to do it if some of the families started these conversations with their children, as Dr. Lindsay said, because those children go on to be police officers, they go on to be clerks, they go on to be all of these people who engage in this work with our black children, requiring them to put on their masks, to put on their, uh, their gear. So the talk has to happen for every family. There's no excuse, there's no reason that you should not talk with your children about what they're doing or what they're experiencing. Thank you so much. I feel like that's a great place to just take a pause because we've got so many questions from the audience. I want to make sure we get as many as possible. Um, so this is our first question. Uh, it's anonymous. It says, it appears that the mental strength and resilience of Black children and youth has worsened. Suicide among Black youth, unheard of as a phenomenon in earlier decades. What has changed in our families and communities? So I guess, Dr. Lindsay, can you start us off? And because that's so much of the work that you've been doing uh, at McSilver and the research that you've conducted over the last few years. And then maybe uh, Dr. Barnes, if you could uh, assist us as well. You know, to my surprise, I actually came across an article earlier, uh, well, last, last summer um, from the archives of general psychiatry from 1968. And in this article, um, the researcher was outlining that we had a black youth suicide issue that no one was talking about. Fast forward to, um, there was a conversation that, um, that uh, I'm blanking on his name now, was having and well, anyway, point is, is that there have been uh, studies documenting for some time now that there has been a black youth suicide issue and that 
uh, we should be paying attention to it. And again, going back to the 60s, I do think that uh, we have greater awareness of the signs and, 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 and symptoms related to uh, psychiatric struggles that might be um, sort of leading to suicide behavior. Um, so we, we're more conversant about it nowadays. I think that children are more self-aware of you know, their struggles emotionally and are able to articulate them. So for example, in our study that found the rates of suicide attempts rising over the last 25 to 30 years, those are self-report indications from kids themselves that they are experiencing suicidal thoughts or had planned a suicide, had attempted a suicide. And so I do think that, um, you know, in terms of our abilities to recognize it and talk about it, that has increased. And so that could be related to why we're seeing uh, more and more of the um, behaviors rising. You know, you when you talk about the five to 11 year olds, you, you can't discount the fact that those rates relate to suicide deaths. And so, um, you know, we need to be paying greater attention to, like Dr. Barnes said, the kind of means and access uh, kids have to weapons. Uh, we also need to help kids be able to process their emotional pain, uh, to be able to talk about things that are, they're struggling with. And then lastly, I'll say that we need to also be doing more safety planning and kept paying careful attention to how we work through and problem solve uh, with kids when they're uh, facing those struggles. And the evidence on Blacks and their abilities to you know, do that kind of um, sort of safety planning is not quite there as much as it is for other racial and ethnic groups. So Dr. Lindsay, I just want to stick with you really quickly because we, we got a question in uh, from Christine Motier, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Uh, and at AFSP is what it's called. Uh, they want you to sort of help put all this into action steps. So can you give one or two actionable steps? They have 35,000 AFSAP volunteers and advocates. What should they be doing based on the information that you've just given us and the research that you've done? Yeah, I think we need to, as I said earlier, we need to ensure that more behavioral health professionals are available in schools proximal to where these issues are happening. I think we also need to come up with culturally competent um, sort of uh, awareness campaigns uh, and education for parents, for teachers, coaches, whomever are close to kids. Uh, we need to be developing those educational materials so that um, those who are close to those kids are aware of what those indications that a kid might be struggling and contemplating suicide, you know, what that looks like, because oftentimes we hear from, from, from families that they just didn't know, they, they weren't aware that their kids were struggling with any kinds of, you know, issues related to suicide. And I know Dr. Barnes is really close to his work and she can speak to that as well. But, you know, those education uh, strategies and campaigns, we definitely need to be incredibly intentional about how we develop them and ensure that they're culturally competent and that they can reach kids. You know, it strikes me also that, you know, we talk about crisis helplines and all those kinds of things. And the reality is that our black kids and families are not going to pick up a crisis helpline when they're struggling with a, a mental health issue. And unfortunately, if it's, uh, you know, sort of behavioral in its presentation, law enforcement may be involved. And so we just have to, you know, be careful about how we develop these materials and make sure that we're doing things that are consistent with the normative, you know, and, and uh, expectations and experiences of uh, Black youth and their families. Thank you. Dr. Barnes, did you want to add uh, anything, anything else to what Dr. Lindsay just stated? Well, well the, um, in reference to the first question, what has happened that the rate has increased, like Dr. Lindsay said, it's been increasing since the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and it has just become more apparent. What is new is that they're taking their own lives at a younger age, from five to 12. 
that was very shocking. So that's what's new, but it, suicide is not new among our organizations. The other thing is that in reference to action steps, I'm not so sure AFSP can do the job in reference to reaching out. Um, it really needs to be community-based people who are in the community because Dr. Jones had talked about this briefly. She didn't say it, but she hinted on it, that we really need ethnic matching. A lot of those social workers that Dr. Lindsay talked about need to be from the same culture because these kids, um, when they present their issues, they present it in a manner that the dominant culture cannot identify with. Um, and that really is a, a major problem. You can put, you can put, uh, 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 clinicians in front of them, but if they they don't understand what they're going through, they're going to filter it with their references, and their references are so different from our, our black children. And you know, and we, there's a lot of misdiagnosis and um, underdiagnosis for ADHD and bipolar with these black children because the physicians. Uh, totally unaware of their racial and cultural biases. They'll just assume that they have ADHD and they'll just provide all this medication for them when they haven't really done a, a very good assessment. Uh, Dr. Jones, did you wanna add anything to, to what Dr. Barnes just stated? Sure, I echo everything that she shared. Of course, the challenges with school districts is that a lot of times our staff are tenured. So we get what we get and we have to deal with that accordingly. That's why, yes, if we could, if we could increase the number of um, social workers, psychologists of color to, in order to support our students, that would certainly help. But sometimes that's not possible. So the cultural competence um, certainly has to come into play. And a perfect example of that is I have a large Latinx community. Um, and a lot of obviously Latinx students in my school district. And so when there is a miscommunication between the teacher and the student, the student may look down. And if the teacher doesn't understand that they're looking down as a respect, they actually interpret it as them being disrespectful. And it actually escalates and gets to the point where they're disciplined and perhaps sent home for something that they were speaking two different languages, trying to um, move forward with the same, the same outcome. And it didn't end up that way. The other thing I'd like to say that I think has uh, largely uh, uh, contributed to the challenges we face is social media. Social media has increased exponentially the level of anxiety because children who are on social media all the time become increasingly anxious because they're looking for affirmations, they're looking for likes, they're looking for things that they don't find in themselves um, at that young age. And the other thing that creates a lot of stress for children is anxiety in the parents and anxiety in the teachers. Mm -hmm. So what happens if the teachers are anxious, the, the children feel that anxiety in the delivery of the instruction. They, they sense that something is off. And when they sense something that's off at home and in school, it, it leads to an incredible amount of stress on top of all the uncertainty and anxieties they're already experiencing all around them. Thank you, Dr. Jones. And I want to build on something uh, that you mentioned about the family structure and, and bring in Dr. Anderson and Ann Williams-Isom. Uh, so Dr. Anderson, I'll start with you. Uh, one of the questions we have is how can we break the stigma that some Black people have about getting that counseling and support for themselves and then also getting it for their children or their child. And you, both you and uh, Ann williams Isom have, have alluded to that throughout the course of the panel, but walk us through sort of how do we undo decades of, of people feeling like, you know, I'm not crazy, so I'm not going to seek help. I'm not gonna go see a therapist or a psychologist uh, for myself or for my child. 
I'm excited to jump on that. I know Anne was. Yes, yeah, I, I wanted to say Anne. something about the previous. I, I don't. I don't know if we covered it, but clusters. So when somebody does commit suicide, the possibility for other kids in the school to do it. And I just want to make sure that someone touched on it because it happened to us a couple of years ago. And it was about two or three that happened within a month. And we got very anxious and really had to work with the professionals to figure out how to communicate with the parents and what that kind of for lack of a better term, you guys will tell me the right term, the collective trauma and the survivor's guilt that was experienced by the classmates of the person that committed suicide. I just want to make sure to say that before we got to the, um, the other conversation. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for that, Anne. So uh, one thing that I like to do is think about the terms that we're using. So in the, the program that I've developed, we call it the Embrace Program. We talk about sessions, we talk about meetings, but we don't call it therapy. And we're very clear about that in our, uh, the work that we do. If you think about what therapy is, and you think about the places where Black people go, oh, they engage in somebody's therapy. They are getting haircuts. They are getting their hair washed. They are going to churches. They are going to cookouts. Like these are places where you are unpacking what's going on in your life, but your own living room. These are spaces that you're unpacking. So I just like to talk about it in that way. I talk about the behaviors or the actions rather than the place, right? Or like the thing that folks are doing. So I said, do you need to get something off your chest? I see your knee shaking up and down, friend. That looks like you got a lot going on. Tell me about that. If you're able to, to talk about it in a way that simply is saying, you seem to be burdened. You seem to, to have a lot going on. What would make you feel a bit better, right? The one thing that we were talking about earlier, how do you, how do you, Dr. Barnes was, was talking about how do we notice things in our children? I always talk about this idea of data. So if you are feeling incredibly stressed, your, your knee is moving, you're not sleeping, you're not eating, that's data. And that's telling us that something's not quite right. And therapy is all about how do we get it right for you? And, and so talking about it in that way, man, last week, you seem to be doing pretty well. This week, you seem to be a bit shaken up. What would make you feel a bit better? Pulling from them their own elicitation of, man, maybe it is time for me to do something. Maybe, and maybe that thing isn't therapy, right? Maybe the first step is not therapy, but can we get them to even think about something's not quite right? And I'll just close by saying in our program, the Embrace program, we meet with families for five sessions. And by the end, they're like, I, I like this. Like, can we stay talking to you? Or like, can we have more resources? So once you get them involved in some program of some sort to unpack, to talk about what's been going on, we have found that it has just worked wonders. And we, I've seen that in a number of uh, therapeutic programs that I've been involved in. So, so again, reframing, naming it, giving it another way of, of talking about it, but acknowledging you have already done this. You're already mm -hmm. doing these processes. What would it be like to get you with someone who can talk just about you for an hour. What would that mm -hmm. be like? So posing that type of question. Thank you. And, and Anne, would you like to build on that? My, my sister's already always saying what I want to say, but I, the only thing that I would add is that um, this idea of having the, you got to be there at the right time. So the, the 16 year old that's looking at me like, Miss Anne, you know, I'm not going to therapy. I got to have the right person for him at the right time and be able to get him there once he says, all right, all right, fine, I'm going to do it. And as Dr. Anderson said, inevitably, they are, their guard comes down. Um, Professor Greer, I told you the amount of women, black moms who come into my office because someone thinks they're bringing in there to get in trouble and to tell on them. And then her and I sit down and both of us start crying. And I'm like, listen, I can't be the only one that's in therapy in here. I know you need therapy. I'm trying to run this. And people feel like, well, if Miss Ann can be in therapy, if you need support, then I can too. So this idea of them, it's, can't, it's not just for the crazy people, it's for all of us and people who are well go to therapy and talk to somebody. I think that that's something um, that's very important, being able to be there at the right time and letting people know that all of us, their teachers, their CEOs, their pastors, everybody needs somebody to talk to. Mm -hmm. And really breaking down that stigma. Um, yeah. One of the questions, and, and I don't know if, if Dr. Barnes or Dr. Lindsay uh, can answer this or, or put it in the chat, uh, someone wants to know, are there any programs for parents who have lost a child to suicide? Uh, and if that's the case, if you all could provide that information, um, if we if we know that. Yes, uh, I can. Let me speak. Is this okay? I conduct um, support groups for families who have lost someone to suicide. 
I have eight week sessions about three or four times a year. And we're cur currently finishing up our sessions for January and February and the next one starts February 9th. But I have been running support groups for family who has lost someone to suicide for since 2004. So yes, that, that's one program that's for, for parents. Great, thank you. Well, we only have about uh, a few more minutes. So I'm just gonna ask essentially a lightning round uh, to each of the panelists. And I'll, I'll just go in the order that I introduced you all. But if you could just tell us really quickly, uh, what gives you hope about our young people? Uh, and what is one takeaway that you want parents and community members uh, to know uh, about mental health or about your work? So Dr. Anderson, I'll start with you. What is giving you hope uh, about our young people and what's an action step that we should be taking? The young people this summer showed up and showed out in a way that let me know we are in fact gonna be all right. Like they, I was floored by their resistance and their seeking liberation at this time. So that gives me incredible hope to know as, as we talk about it, that the Black Panther uh, costume gets that energy, collects it, and then expels it back into the world and says, I'm not going to let it uh, to intervene with my wellness. And, and it's not going to get inside of me. I'm going to push it back out. That's what I saw with the Black youth this summer. And I was incredibly charged up. Um, I, I just want to indicate that we've seen that in the work that we've done, where you give children that opportunity, the space to unpack, to give back to the world what they've been trying to give to them. And these youth are fired up to leave. So don't miss that opportunity just to give children the space. They, are, they know what's going on. They see it. They can talk to you better than you can probably talk to them about it. They know what's going on. So give them the space. Don't underestimate our youth. They are phenomenal. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Barnes, what gives you hope about our young people and what's an action step people can take? The fact that we're having discussions such as this um, and we have so many adults who are willing to help these kids because as, as I mentioned before, we need to build adult protective shields and have mentorships and, and adults who are responsible and can lead by, by doing with these young kids. Um, just the fact that we are beginning to create spaces for them and understand just like uh, Dr. Anderson was talking about. So I don't have much more to add. I do have hope and I do um, work hard to continue doing the things that we're doing. We just all need to continue doing what we're doing and hopefully things will work out. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Ginsburg, hope and action steps. The hope is always that the young people, the hope is that when the beauty is there uh, already. We don't have to create anything. The beauty, the genius, the brilliance is, is all there. And we, when we see, and, and the hope is that mental health support works, right? right? It, it, it actually helps. Um, and so, and so um, that, that's the hope. And for those of us who've seen those stories happen when the services are provided, when support is provided, when the relationships are built, that, that it makes a big difference. Um, and that's the, that's the hope. Um, and, and, and young people we're lucky are, are so persistent um, and, and they, they, can, they can move forward. Um, they're not like us adults uh, sometimes. And I think um, the, the, the action step, um, I don't, I, I think what I'd love to do because I saw a couple of things in the chat. I would really like to, to speak particularly to people identify as white who've come onto this or watch this. And I think it's really crucial in, and I'm still doing this work in a big way, but we can't see health justice outside of what, or what Mills would call the racial contract, right? So Dr. Anderson was talking about this before. The burden's not randomly there, right? It, it, it's actually been placed and it's been done piece by piece over hundreds of years, particularly in the American context. And, and then secondarily, we also can't look at it fully theoretically either. It's, we are a part of that contract as white people now, and we are doing that now. And if we don't uh, intervene in that contract, it will just keep going the way it has been going. Uh, and so I think that that is critical in terms of getting proximate, as Stevenson would said to the work, in terms of actually thinking about your own biases, your own racism, your own thoughts when you think about why, why do you know that your child, your white child needs a $300 an hour therapist, but you didn't advocate for health insurance uh, for people who don't 
have money so they can't just pick a, a provider that works for them. So we can't have more black and brown providers, et cetera. We have to see that hypocrisy um, and we have to address it. And if the burden has been placed then the burden must be removed by the same, we have to be the unpackers of, of the problem. Thank you. Um, Dr. Jones. Sure, I, um, what gives me hope is seeing the children step up and raise their voice and be more involved in committees and actions. When they see what happened with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, they're speaking up for a change in the curriculum. They're speaking up and saying, we demand to see more faces that look like us in the cu curriculum. And this is part of a therapeutic healing process for them to speak up and speak out about and being a, an activist in what they want to learn in school. That gives me a lot of hope. What gives me hope is in the midst of this pandemic, what I have seen is that through our um, Zoom protocols and Facebook Lives, we've been able to engage parents in conversations that traditionally um, they didn't show up for PTA and board meetings, but now because they need to get so much information in real time, they're showing up, they're listening to the messaging that we have to say, and we're getting a lot of information to very large parents. And once parents begin to become re-engaged in their children's learning and what's going on and what resources we have available for them, change uh, trajectories and outcomes because we need the home and the family together to work in tandem to move the needle for our children. Thank you. Uh, Ann Williams-Isom, I got it perfect that time. <laughs> I want to say that for me, I get my energy from young people. So they are a manifestation of hope for me. They are my inspiration. And I know that that's probably true for a lot of people who are on this call tonight who work with young people. I want to remind people that this is a journey, uh, you know, just like with your health. You don't do something healthy for five days and then think it's going to be done. You don't ever have to do it again. You have to pay attention to it. You have to pay attention to your, your mental health. And that's what we need for young people. It's not going to be fixed in one period of time and then we're done, especially as we all just said, we're coming out of this pandemic and we know that all of us have been affected and traumatized in some way. I want to say that the action step, and I know y'all don't want to hear from me, but I'm going to say it again, is I need you to take care of yourself. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you cannot see the signs for what's happening with the young people around you. You're going to miss the signs. You're not going to be able to take the information in the way that you need to. So when I talk about sleep and nutrition and exercise and going your peace, all of those things, I know that our, our ancestors and our mamas didn't raise us that way, but it's something that we need to do. And what do we say? It's a revolutionary act. Self-care is a revolutionary act. So think about that. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Lindsay. You know, I am uh, inspired, uh, similar to Dr. Jones, by the nature in which uh, kids, our young kids have, um, you know, raised their voice and have been activated around the matters of the racial reckoning, uh, the disproportionate sort of outcomes related to uh, the pandemic on communities of color. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to young folks and my family. Uh, I taught for the first time an undergrad class um, at NYU with, with mostly freshmen who had just come to NYU from high schools and talked about even last spring, some of the work that they did in their high schools to uh, raise greater attention to these issues, calling for uh, greater accountability within the curriculum to have more representation of the histories of struggle and protest uh, to be reflected in that curriculum. And so I'm really um, hopeful and inspired that the next generation is, is really on top of this and are using their, their, their um, relative positions to, um, to really educate themselves and, and, to, and to understand why it's important that they're educated on the issues and concerns. And I'm, and I'm also sort of, uh, in terms of a strategy, I will uh, you know, sort of suggest for folks to continue to check in with kids, you know, converse with them about how they're feeling, what 
kinds of things they're struggling with or what things are they excited about, but just continuing to engage kids and talk to them about the things that matter to them emotionally, um, in terms of their futures, whatever the case may be. Thank you so much. Well, that's all the time we have. And I wanna thank our panelists this evening and our co-sponsors. And I wanna thank our viewers. You all could have been anywhere this evening uh, to celebrate Martin Luther King's birthday and you chose to spend it with NYU's McSilver Institute uh, and these wonderful panelists. And I've learned a ton and I cannot wait uh, to put some of it into practice. Uh, for those of you who are watching, you can access the resources relating to mental health and Black youth using the bit.ly link displayed on the slides uh, that will come up, or you can go to the NYU McSilver Institute's homepage, where they'll also, uh, we're going to post the archived video sometime tomorrow. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay, for all of the work you do, uh, your staff. Uh, for all of the work they do uh, and continue to do to uh, put these types of events together to educate not just the NYU community, but the public at large. I'm Dr. Christina Greer. Have a wonderful MLK evening and onward and upward. Thank you. <laughs>